Michael Bing, uh, one of the rookies on this flight, they wanted me to sort of describe uh, what it was like to, to get up in the middle of the night and uh, walk out with all kinds of photographers waiting for you and uh, flashing lights to make you blind when you tried to stumble into the trailer and uh, then we were on our way. It's a short uh, four or five miles trip and it's uh, an eerie feeling when you get into that vehicle and there's nobody else around. Uh, main engine ignition uh, lasts for about six seconds. You can feel the vibration in the vehicle. Uh, fortunately, we couldn't see all the smoke and steam and fire coming out the back end. Uh, gimbal the engines uh, just before uh, takeoff after they're lit, and uh, when you lift off, you'll be able to see the shock waves in the main engines. T0, the, uh, the hold down bolts are blown, and uh, the SRBs light and we're on our way. I personally got a chance to see the, uh, the tower glide by out my peripheral vision, and then the uh, the roll shortly after tower cleared. If you look closely there, you can see the uh, the diamond shock waves and the exhaust of the main engines. John Young said uh, uh, after he came back from uh, flight one and saw the uh, in the, the movies of that Eddie Shear was glad he couldn't see all that flame and smoke, or he'd been a whole lot more concerned during liftoff. That's a a bit of a a rough ride during the first uh, two minutes and eleven seconds of the flight, when which the uh, solid rockets are are burning. Uh, we're about to go supersonic. If you look closely, you can see the shock waves forming on both the SRB and the uh, uh, the orbiter itself. Uh, this is the first time, to my knowledge, that the shock waves have engulfed the whole back of the uh, of the orbiter itself. They go all the way from the uh, cockpit all the way back to the tail. We were fortunate to have a very clear day. Two minutes and uh, uh, eleven seconds. We had SRB set. From the cockpit point of view, there was a loud bang and a flash of light across the windscreen, and it left an opaque film on the windows, which made looking straight out the forward windows uh, somewhat more difficult for the rest of the ascent, although I was spending most of my time watching the gauges inside. And after the main engine uh, burnout at Miko, uh, about eight minutes and 30 seconds into the flight, we got our first uh, real look at the, uh, at the world gliding by outside. Spectacular sight. The first day on orbit, uh, we deployed uh, Morelos. Uh, Hughes telecommunication satellite for Mexico. This is the first telecommunication satellite which uh, which Mexico owns and they will be flying again with us uh, late next year. Uh, the deployment of a PAM and telecommunication satellite is really a crew effort and it takes an integrated teamwork by five folks in order to get one of these things off and to document it. Here you can see uh, John Creighton in the right seat up there piloting the orbiter and pointing it and I'm talking through the orbiter's general purpose computer to the satellite which is back in the bay. Shannon Lucid is uh, operating the standard switch panel which uh, controls the, the ordinance uh, on the booster. Uh, Shannon's not real fond of this camera angle, <laughs> as you can see. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Dan is, is overseeing the entire operation and Steve Nagel is getting all the photo documentation. And there's Morelos coming out. It comes out rather smoothly. It's about two foot per second uh, uh, separation rate as it tracks right straight up the tail. And uh, we've deployed it retrograde here uh, and inertially so that a half a rev later, it'll be pointed in the proper direction to go for geosynchronous. Really nice photography here uh, with a zoom capability to pick this guy out. This is a deployment of, uh, of Arabsat. Uh, deployed for a consortium of, of Arab nations which uh, comprise the Arab League. And uh, again, you can, uh, you can see there's a level of intensity here associated with doing one of these deployments. We, we recognize the, the importance of these things and, and their value. Uh, and here's uh, Arabsat going out. Uh, it's uh, built by Aerospatiale, a, a French corporation. And uh, it looks, of course, considerably different than the, the other satellite which we had for Hughes. Arab site is, as a matter of fact, uh, operating very well now in the uh, synchronous orbit, and uh, that's when I started uh, breathing again, is when it came out of the shuttle. So uh, it's doing very well, I have to report that. Again, you, here, as in many shots, you'll see the limb of the Earth uh, in the background. And this is the third telecommunication satellite deployment. Uh, this is Telstar uh, for AT&T. It's the 100th satellite uh, put into space by uh, the Hughes Company, and uh, we're pleased to have been a part of that. And again, you can see uh, the look of concentration on folks' uh, faces as we get down to the count. And here it goes out again, 6,000 pounds of force pushes it out of the cargo bay, and you can feel that. It's, it's a real thump on the vehicle. 
when uh, th that uh, spring force goes off. I think our pointing accuracies uh, were measured in uh, hundredths of the uh, required accuracy. So uh, everything was, in fact, done, done very well from the orbiter point of view, as well as a nominal countdown. Having good equipment and good procedures and, and good training in advance makes uh, these deployments routine in space. Steve and I are doing some work on the IG experiment, and uh, I think we've gotten enough material on that experiment to, uh, to get a PhD for the research and a couple more for me and Steve. So. I think all the training and preparation uh, for the camera work paid off because uh, all of us were uh, quite familiar with the cameras uh, to be able to document the various aspects of the, this mission. Uh, this is just a 16 millimeter uh, pass across Madagascar. And our primary objective uh, in photography was to get still 70 millimeter of that, but uh, we thought some movies would be nice. This will give you a, a, a good idea of uh, the rate at which the ground's passing under you on the various passes. Uh, you can see if you want to do still photography, you better know what you want to shoot and uh, get your camera set up and shoot it. And uh, we're looking at uh, deforestation and uh, burn off in many of the areas of the world, Madagascar being one of those. And that's me taking some more pictures also for one of my uh, experiments. <coughs> I made a deal with the geologists in Saudi Arabia. Any mineral findings, the crew gets half, but they said no, just a thank you note. <laughs> That's uh, the first group of uh, French experiments uh, in the area of uh, neurosensory uh, physiology. And uh, in fact, we take uh, signals from uh, certain muscles, muscles on the legs and muscles of the eyes, and to, to build a strategy of the equilibrium in, uh, in uh, weightlessness. I was uh, fixing dinner one day and I asked uh, Patrick, uh, Patrick, you hungry? Uh, well, would you like dinner anyway? <laughs> would you like coffee with your dinner, Patrick? How about some milk? Lemonade, maybe? How about some wine with dinner? Now you see, uh, not all the moments on the flight deck uh, were as intense as a satellite deployment, and we took the opportunity to do some photography uh, on board also. Uh, a lot of the time when we weren't deploying a satellite or the Spartan, uh, we were looking out the window or, like J.O., just, just having a lemonade here. Okay. As you see, not all retrievals on this flight were successful. So let John Fabian do this one. <laughs> in fact, we and we fighted very much to, to to have our food, and uh, even when we were both both of us uh, fighting very much, we we were not all the time very successful. Experimenting here with some more retrievals. Those are the two satellites we didn't deploy. The food service uh, system on the shuttle works really nicely, and of course we eat a lot of rehydratable food, which uh, is a byproduct of the backpacking uh, industry in this country. Uh, the, the galley is, uh, is nice to use. In fact, it works so well that we found out halfway through the flight that we'd forgotten to set three circuit breakers, so it works even better with everything on. Hey, once the food is uh, prepared, a lot of times we like to go up on the flight deck and eat. It's really nice to sit there and eat and look out the window and just watch the world go by. As a matter of fact, J.O. is hanging up there in the window trying to get uh, uh, one of the Earth observation passes. And I guess he was so intent on doing that, he, uh, he, he hadn't even started to eat yet. But as you um, can see in this pan, it's a pan around the cockpit, that uh, there was not a tremendous amount of room to spare. It gets very crowded. Is everybody up there? But we optimized the window space, I have to say that. That's true. <laughs> Obviously, my table wasn't ready, so I had to wait a little bit. But the food was really good, and I think meal times were was one of the high points of the day. That's a posture experiment, and about the French experiment, I, I must tell you that, uh, in fact, all the crew was participating. 
because uh, as you see it takes uh, a bit of room in, in the mid deck and to help me um, all the crew tried to, to not uh, um, go in, into the mid deck when I was working and that was very it was very great and uh, Shannon worked on the, the French uh, echograph you'll see later and Sultan was working with me all the time on the posture experiment and uh, both experiments worked uh, worked very very well and the French scientists when we came back were, were so happy that they could not sleep during one week and uh, we we take we took back uh, such a lot of uh, good data that uh, they could not believe so they are very happy and uh, uh, very thank you very much uh, all the crew not not only uh, Sultan and Chena and me that's what you get for uh, letting a test pilot do medical experiments on you so. <laughs> I still don't think Patrick will, be, will, will make a good doctor he never do that <laughs> <laughs> Well, J.O. and I were the deployment team for deploying Spartan. J.O. was flying the orbiter, and I was flying the arm. And here you see a shot of the arm coming down over the grapple fixture on the Spartan that was in the bay. And then we grappled it, and then we released the Spartan, and we were sort of surprised it sort of rose up on the, uh, uh, in the rim there. And then we used the arm, and we very carefully uh, maneuvered Spartan out of the bay, and we're, of course, looking to make sure we don't run into anything and then we take uh, Spartan up and then point it in the correct attitude before uh, uh, we released it. Now the background there in the picture Steve had was taking the movies and he had to stand back a ways. He couldn't get right up to the window of course because J.O. and I were using the windows and that's just uh, smudges and desiccant in the background that were causing the uh, spots there on the, on the black part of the picture. But the arm worked as advertised. It's really a very versatile piece of machinery. And here you can see that we released uh, the Spartan and very uh, gently pulling the arm back so that we didn't induce any uh, tip operates in, into the uh, Spartan. At the moment of uh, release, uh, Shannon's work was done and mine just started. Uh, we trained uh, for a variety of tip operates, but fortunately uh, the uh, Spartan was rock solid. And shortly after we released it, uh, the Spartan went through a programmed rotation maneuver first rotated one direction about 45 degrees and stopped and then rotated back and uh, it had to go through these uh, these motions before the uh, we were certain that the uh, the Spartan was really going to work and once it did then we were given a go to uh, to separate from the Spartan and and we did had it not gone through these rotations then Shannon would re grappled it with the arm and we would have put it back in the payload bay and we separated at approximately one foot per second out uh, to about uh, eight nine hundred feet, and then we did a second separation maneuver in a in a retrograde uh, fashion to separate out to about a hundred miles from the Spartan over a two day period, and then to return and uh, and get it on the rendezvous. And there you can see the uh, uh, Spartan was uh, approximately uh, four hundred feet below us there as we were passing over uh, Ecuador. That's uh, certainly the most beautiful time during the flight when you look at the window of the Earth and space. I was amazed how far away you could see the uh, way you could see the uh, part. We tracked it with the uh, with our eyes uh, quite a ways out, and then on the rendezvous uh, two days later, when we were coming up on it, we uh, first got an, uh, a visual observation of the uh, Spartan uh, about 36 miles away. Well, you have to live on the spacecraft too, and uh, it like, seems like I'm either cooking or eating. Uh, J.O. spent a lot of time back there in the corner. Uh, he was the cleanest crew member than on board. Uh, Far and away, you know, I'd be I'd be finished by now if I were I were washing my face. Shannon would be finished by now if it were her. We had to cut this. We only sent about ten percent. <laughs> <laughs> so when I did my famous fifteen hundred uh, fifteen hundred uh, miles all in one shot. You get tired running fifteen hundred miles. Took about five minutes. Uh, you see, all the equipment did not work very, very well. <laughs> that was a major failure in the French uh, experiments. People often ask uh, how you sleep and where you sleep, so we decided to document this. And uh, you'll see that Dan and J.O. chose to sleep on the flight deck in their seats uh, with, the, with the black sleep goggles on. 
and uh, the position of the arms is simply uh, where they go when all the muscles relax. Uh, also up in the flight deck uh, was John. You can see from this picture he was pretty uptight during the whole mission. <laughs> He just slept uh, kind of free-floating uh, behind the back seats on the, on the flight deck. There were uh, four others of us uh, downstairs, and you'll see a, a camera pass through the mid-deck. Uh, Never Sultan complain uh, about hotel <laughs> accommodations after this one. <laughs> Sultan uh, liked it best up on the lockers. And uh, Patrick moved around a little bit, but some nights he was, he was on the wall uh, with me, just above me. And if you count heads, that leaves, uh, that's up to six now. And uh, you might wonder where the seventh person is. We never really saw the seventh person, but you can just see a part of the sleeping bag hanging out from inside the airlock there. And that's where I had to tap Shannon and wake her up each morning. That the other group of uh, friends experiment, the echograph. And um, that was the first time that such uh, sophisticated equipment could be used such early after the launch. And uh, really, it worked perfectly. And uh, less than three hours after the launch, I could work and uh, take the first data. Still haven't figured out what I'm doing there, but uh, it's one of my experiments, the phase separation experiments. I have to report also, like Patrick did, all the data we came back with came out really great. They did make a photographer out of me, and I'm trying to forget everything I learned. We participated in an experiment, uh, a tracking experiment of the orbiter called the HPTE, or High Precision Tracking Experiment. And on the, uh, the second attempt, as we pointed the side hatch window with a small reflector mounted in it at uh, the island of Maui, Hawaii, we spotted a, a very low-powered uh, laser which was uh, blinking on and off. This is a view from one of the payload bay cameras, and the iris of the camera was responding to the different intensities of light. So to the naked eye, it didn't look quite as dramatic as it does in, in these photos. But uh, uh, it did demonstrate a capability of uh, not only the ground to track the orbiter, but the uh, orbiter to precisely point uh, any portion of it at a point on the ground also. Well, after uh, a day and a half of uh, letting Spartan uh, fly on its own and uh, get its data, it was time to turn around and come back, and uh, here we're already closing in on it on the V-bar, which uh, we're at about uh, 200 feet, and he's zooming in a little bit here, but uh, the whole rendezvous went uh, very smoothly. Uh, we had a little bit of a eye-opener at uh, one of our burns where we had two jets fail, but uh, we had uh, practiced those in simulations uh, so often that uh, we went right through that with no problem. We closed in on it. Uh, here you can see the sun setting in the background. Uh, we still don't have the explanation as to why, but Spartan did not end up in the exact attitude we expected it. So uh, we had to do a little uh, real-time uh, planning up there into how we anticipated uh, grabbing a hold of it. And uh, essentially what we did was fly, fly it a little bit forward in the payload bay and a little bit uh, lower. And uh, then John uh, could, by moving the arm, could reach around behind it. And here you see the view uh, from the end of the, of the robot arm, the TV camera sitting out on the end effector, as we call it, and uh, the grapple target uh, right there in, in front of you. Dan provided, as you can tell here, a very stable platform uh, from which to operate the, the, the robot arm. And it's a very capable system. Uh, and this, I think, indicates that things don't have to be perfect in order to use this, uh, this mechanism. And uh, we were obviously overjoyed uh, when we finally picked it up. John let out a war hoop that about scared us all to death when he grabbed it. <laughs> and here you see it uh, sitting on the arm. We, uh, we kept it out there for a little bit until the sun came up so we could uh, get some photographs of Spartan and document its condition prior to putting it into the bay. And at that time, it was time to sneak it down into the latches. And uh, the arm did, uh, did its job again here very well. It's a, quite a high precision device and uh, one which we are going to continue to use very successfully with the shuttle program. I think that the, the really unique things about the shuttle program are the capabilities not only to put things into space, but also to bring them back to Earth. The arm is an integral part of that, as well as the capability to repair satellites in space. You can see uh, the capability to maneuver very accurately and precisely uh, with the arm is important to us. Well, unfortunately, like just about everything in life, all good things have to come to an end sometime. And after we deployed the satellites and got Spartan out and back, it was time to get ready to come back home. Here you see us on deorbit morning. Actually, we were very organized and everything went really smooth. Uh, 
it might not look quite that way, but everything had a place and we had everything in the proper place. We have to uh, put the seats back in and then we had to put all the dirty clothes, those were in those mesh bags and stow, stow them away so they wouldn't hit anybody on um, as we came back in. And the other brown bags floating up there were the helmet bags and we were putting them by the seats so that everybody would have uh, their own helmets to put back on. Reentry uh, is not quite as spectacular as uh, launch, but uh, when you are uh, coming through the air at uh, around uh, Mach uh, 20 to 22 and you start getting the rosy glow, it's uh, really spectacular. Uh, John was also taking some pictures looking out the back, and uh, maybe he can describe to you what he's seeing. This is looking out the uh, overhead window, and the, the tail of the vehicle is not in sight. What you're seeing here is simply the interaction of shock waves around the vehicle converging up over the top of the spacecraft and making that very intense picture and then back to the glow uh, on the windows with very intense heat outside the glass. Coming uh, across to California we're heading east into a rising sun so once again we couldn't see anything due to the haze on the windows but once we got uh, part way around the hack as you see here I could uh, make out the runway we uh, decided to go to runway 23 as a result of the predicted winds and uh, as we rolled out on final uh, the winds were a crosswind, so uh, you can try and predict wind, but you aren't always going to hit it correctly. At that point, it was too late to change runways, and uh, we continued on to the lake bed uh, runway 2-3. Uh, the vehicle, as has been said before by previous uh, commanders who have flown, it handles very well, and uh, even in a crosswind, uh, you probably have to work a little more at it, but it still uh, is a very uh, precise flying machine, and all the training we get in the shuttle training aircraft uh, certainly helps because uh, you can see the gear come down here uh, at the, when you do your first landing, it's got to be a good one for real the first time. It's good to have all that training behind you and you feel confident uh, that everything is going to work out just fine, uh, as it did in this case. We uh, touched down and uh, pretty lightly bounced just a little bit, uh, got the nose down, and we'd, uh, by design, tried to do uh, almost a max braking. They wanted uh, 10 to 12 foot per second braking rate as we touched down. The lake bed was a little bit soft, and you can see when we start getting on the binders, there's a pretty good uh, cloud of dust uh, being kicked up behind it. We, uh, I guess, have the record now for the shortest stop uh, from wheels down to stop was uh, 7,400 feet, and uh, the braking profile was uh, right on what they expected. It varied between 10 and 12 foot per second, uh, almost all the way to touchdown, I mean, all the way to stop. Once uh, we got stopped, we have to go through a few uh, post-flight uh, checklist items and uh, shut down the APUs and the like, uh, reconfigure the GPCs, and then it's uh, time to get out and take a shower. Here we're coming down the steps. Uh, I almost pulled the Gerald Ford. Uh, we uh, <laughs> meet our boss, George Abbey, and uh, everybody... Uh, Everybody came through the flight in really great shape. As you can see, everybody's down, bouncing around, and uh, uh, sad the flight's over, but also happy to be back, and uh, we were uh, very pleased with the whole mission.